Welcome, welcome. Uh, today on Into the Terminal, we're going to be covering local virtualization. So, Nate, why don't we jump on into the terminal? Yeah, yeah. Virtualization. It's one of my favorite features of RHEL, to be honest, because I think it's so convenient that I've got RHEL or, honestly, I've got a Linux kernel. I can do virtualization, right? So uh, here we are at my home lab. Okay, so this is a RHEL box in my basement. It's got like 128 gig of memory and I don't know, a dozen or so CPU cores, enough for me to do home labby stuff, right? And I use two things on this box. One of them is containers and the other is KVM-based virtual machines. And we'll talk about those terms after the uh, transition. So first of all, we're gonna give you some real basics, right? Let's see what VMs I have running on this machine. And this is one of the things I love so much about how this works on RHEL is there's really powerful command line tools like this, but then there's also a web UI we're going to show you. Uh, I don't think we're going to show you during the critical path, but after the break, you'll get to see that. So these are running VMs, right? So you can see I've got my AdGuard machine. It's like DNS for my home lab and for my, my you know, keep my kids from looking at stuff I don't want them to. Uh, I've got a couple IDM boxes that are for, again, for home labby stuff. I've got my home assistant box running in here, right? So these are all things that are running on top of RHEL, even though they don't necessarily run RHEL, right? Um, I've also got an IDM lab sitting there, two of them, in fact. That's what all those IDM and CLI boxes are. But these are only running VMs. What about all the VMs that aren't running? Dash dash all will give us all the running VM or all the VMs that exist on this machine. And you'll see there's a whole bunch more. There's, you know, like, I could go into what these are, but you probably don't care. The one we care about right now is I have one here called ITT0. Could you imagine what that one might exist for? It's it's um, it's the egg for today's lab. <laughs> well, why not ITT1, Nate? Uh, because all arrays start at zero, except for awk. <laughs> For some reason, aux starts at one. All right, so, all right, I've got a VM sitting there and it's not running. How do I run that VM? Well, you might have caught on here that we have versh commands for everything. Versh is the virtual shell, I think is what that stands for, versh. This is how you interact with libvirt, which is a thing we're gonna talk about again after the break. So versh start, right, imagine that. ITT zero, we'll start that VM and then, you can even get a console right here in the terminal on that VM, right? So you, you'll recognize this. This is the boot up sequence of a RHEL box. And it's going to get us right to a login, right? So I think that's pretty cool, right? Now we got to hit control bracket, I think. Yep, to get out of that. So we started up a system. Now if we do a verse list again, we'll see that it's included in the running systems, right? Now there's one more cool thing. Uh, obviously, being able to start and stop VMs, that's cool. What if you want to be able to, what if you want to change something about the VM? So first, we're going to stop this one. First, shut down. Actually initiates, it, it, it issues the, uh, the same command. Yeah, there. It issues the, the, the backend command that would, that would tell the OS, hey, I'd like to shut down, just as though you had tapped the power button on your, your physical machine. So verse shutdown ITT0 will tell it, hey, please shut down. Now there's another command called destroy, which you might think is going to hurt the VM. It doesn't. That's actually more like ripping the power cord out of the wall, right? So if the machine will not shut down, and I've had that a couple cases, especially with Windows VMs, I don't know why. They don't always respect the please shut down. You have to go and be like, shut down, I mean it. <laughs> It's almost like killing a process. In fact, that's exactly what it does. It kills a process. Uh, anyway, so now that it's shut down, I keep doing versh. I keep typoing it backwards here. Dyslexia, I guess. Versh edit uh, ITT0. Let's us see the machine's configuration and edit stuff. Now, you might recognize the format here. This is all XML. Um, I don't know, let's pick something fun to use as an example. How about the operating system, right? Here, this OS block here tells it what architecture are we running? What kind of machine? And this is what kind of machine it should emulate, right? What kind of virtualization to use? 
and which device it should boot off or what type of device it's going to boot off of, right? Uh, here's features that say to use a CPI. Here's some CPU information. Um, somewhere in here, it tells it how many cores. Here it is, VP, vCPU cores. That's how many cores we've got. There's two here. How much memory to allocate. This has four gig of memory, right? Um, you can even add in commands for what to do when to stop and start the thing. Like all kinds of fun stuff here. But again, we can get more in depth in this in a little bit. Hey, Nate. Um, one of the things that happens to me is I will verse console onto my machine and it just, just gives me a blinking cursor. Why is that? So that can happen if the machine that you booted does not have a serial console defined, right? Uh, with RHEL, I've had pretty good luck. A lot of things with a with a graphical environment, you won't have a console because the console is going to the uh, the video output and you can't really emulate that at the terminal, right? So like a is Windows that, VM, for example. Is that serial console defined in this XML too? Uh, now you're going to ask me to find a thing. I believe it is. Um, we've got, no, that's a serial connection, not the console. It might actually be at the kernel, might be a kernel argument uh, at boot time with the, uh, inside the VM. There's like a console yeah. equals, you know, what, you know, where, where to put the console. Yeah, and so uh, if you don't have a serial console defined for the machine, then when you do a verse console, there's nothing for it to connect to because you're not running a serial console for it to connect to. Um, right, right. I digress. So, and, I interrupted your judge. Yep, and by serial console, this would be, you know, if, if you think about the old days when we still had things like physical serial cables connected to the machines, like if you ever had to manage a switch or something over a serial console, same concept. It's outputting the terminal you know, the console over a serial connection and Versh is able to take that and use a virtual console to show you the output of that. So pretty cool stuff. And um, I think that's that's all I had for Critical Path. Any uh, any questions crop up or should we move along? Let, let's uh, transition then we can get into our deeper dive and address any questions if there were any. Sounds good to me. So stay with us as we go a little bit deeper into virtualization on locally running uh, Linux systems. We're going to cover some definition of terms like Nate said, libvirt uh, and KVM. What are those? Uh, we're also going to cover a little bit on using the web console to manage your VMs because it's actually a really slick way of managing systems. Um, we showed you Versh, which of course is into the terminal. So that's where we started. Um, we'll also cover uh, some management of your virtual machines, things like cloning a VM, doing an automated install. So stay with us. Uh, don't forget to mash that like and subscribe button. Uh, so we keep making content like this and you'll be notified when uh, producer Eric schedules it and we go live. All right, we're back. Welcome back. So uh, you wanted to cover some definition of terms. Before you yeah. go, one quick thing. Sure. Uh, do you know where KVM came from? Like the technology? Uh, I know it was, no, I guess it wasn't born out of that. I was thinking it was born out of the QEMU project, but I'm not sure about that. Where did KVM come from, Scott? So kind of. Um, so there was this company called Kumernet uh, which was working on a in-kernel virtual machine management. Um, and at the time, there was another virtual machine uh, Linux kernel related thing called Zen. Mm -hmm. uh, the difference was that Zen was not adopted by the upstream kernel, but KVM right. was integrated into the upstream kernel. Do you know who manages and does a lot of the work on KVM today? I want to say it's Red Hat. That is correct. <laughs> is that what you're going to say? <laughs> so Red Hat bought uh, Kubernet a, a long time ago. This is like 2006, 2007. Um, and so we integrated it into RHEL. And then, of course, other distributions uh, pick it up too because they're using the same Linux kernel that we work upstream in for all the Red Hat technologies. So um, 
if you're watching and you're saying, oh, I could do KVM on Ubuntu, you're welcome. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, um, one of those popular platforms that folks use in their home labs is basically Libvirt in the background, right? With KVM and, and uh, yeah, KVM, right? Yep. Many of them are, in fact. So anyway, so we just threw a bunch of terms around like Libvirt, QEMU, and KVM, and we thought maybe a little bit of groundwork would be a good idea. Um, so let's start with Libvirt. Libvirt itself is basically an abstraction layer or an API in between the user or even some certain some automation platforms uh, in between that and the virtualization backend. If you go to libvirt.org, you'll see there's actually a lot more backends for Libvirt than I thought there were. I, I knew of KVM and Zen. Uh, Zen, of course, Scott mentioned earlier, Zen was a was sort of a predecessor. In RHEL, I think five, you could use Zen to do this like power virtualized uh, virtualization of Linux on Linux, right? And it was hard to do guests that were not, because it wasn't a fully virtual environment. Uh, you couldn't do guests that were like Windows, for example. So if you wanted to do stuff like that, you needed a different hypervisor. And that's where kind of QEMU and KVM came along. QEMU, I mentioned earlier. Uh, so one more thing on Libvirt. That API is more than just those Versh commands that I showed you, although that is one interface to uh, Libvirt. It actually does expose an API that you can interact with through something like Ansible, for example, or um, the, the virtualization platform that Red Hat offered up until recently. Uh, that was all in the background. It was Libvirt, and there was a web UI that would talk to Libvirt through calls to the, to the Libvirt API. So there's, and there's lots of things that will do that. Right. So and, and the cool thing is that in the background, you can do, you know, it abstracts the actual virtualization layer. Right. So that's that's really handy. I like that that feature about Libvirt. So those commands that you're familiar with and the way you interact with it doesn't change based on what the back end is. So um, the next thing was QEMU. QEMU, I've heard people pronounce it as QEMU. Q, you know, QEMU, like I'm pronouncing it, QEMU. Um, I don't know what the right pronunciation is. Like like so many things on Linux, um, maybe we'll never know. But uh, QEMU is the actual virtualization uh, backend. It is a hypervisor that interacts with the KVM backend, which is the kernel virtual machine, which we'll talk about in a second, um, that actually lets you do the virtualization piece, right? Like all of the configuration that we define in libvirt gets passed into QEMU, which then leverages KVM to run a VM, right? I get all that right, Scott. Do you have any comments here? Any questions even that I'm missing? <laughs> I see there's a conversation about the uh, pronunciation in chat there. So Shantanu had a, a good question, which I answered in chat too, but we could surface it here. Okay. Uh, why is RHEL's version of QEMU and KVM always older? Other distros, uh, use the latest, like Debian, Proxmox, et cetera. So why is the version that comes with RHEL older? Well, I mean, it's the same reason most, I shouldn't say most, but many packages on RHEL seem older. That's because of that life cycle that we always come back to. Uh, when, when RHEL 9 was released, whatever was accepted as the version of QEMU and KVM and Libvirt, uh, we're going to try to maintain those versions throughout the life cycle of RHEL 9, for example. So whatever it released with is what we're going to stick with because we don't want to change that underlying infrastructure in a way that might impact production for folks that are just trying to keep their lights on and stay up to date, right? Yeah, and Nate, Nate brought up uh, the API. That's a great example of where right. a race onto something newer could change how something works in your production environment, right? Because a rebase gets newer API calls, or maybe an API call that your software used went away. What happens then? So um, Red Hat essentially forks uh, for every major RHEL release and then maintains that fork over the 10 or so years of RHEL lifespan. The nice thing is every three years, what do we do, Nate, every three years? Every three years, we have another release of RHEL. Predictable. Yeah. It's weird. Yeah. And so like hmm. middle of next year, we should be expecting RHEL 10. And, it'll and then get... you can have the latest and greatest Libvirt and QEMU. 
right in kvm <laughs> all right so the last term that i've thrown around a whole bunch and i've already kind of mentioned what it is is kvm this is the kernel virtual machine and there are by the way links for all these things um because we don't have eric in the background we haven't been great about sharing the links but they'll be in the description of the video in the notes here uh but kvm is like I said, kernel virtual machine. These are actual pieces of code and extensions within the kernel that enable virtualization, right? So this is this is basically how Q QEMU is able to run VMs on Linux, right? So uh, that's you know an, an essential piece to making this making this all functional. So there you go. You're now experts on how virtualization works on Linux, right? So this all these pieces together can turn Linux into a hypervisor, which is pretty awesome. All right. So uh, the next thing I have is another demo. Any other comments or questions before we get into that? All right. So I talked earlier, so I showed you a bunch of the command line on how to interact with VMs. We're going to get a little deeper into that. But first, I also wanted to show you how um, virtualization management on KVM on RHEL can work through our good old friend, the web console. So I'm looking at web console right here. This is again, the one I use to manage my home lab. If we go to virtual machines here over on the side, now there's a plugin called, I think systems, cockpit dash systems you have to install to make this interaction work. But here you go. We've got the same old list of virtual machines that I showed you in that virtual list dash dash all. So if I were to go back to ITT zero, our guinea pig for this, this show, you can see that he shut off. That's because I told it to shut off before we before the transition earlier. And uh, this is kind of its layout. It's got you know networking, and it's got its disk, and it's got how much memory and CPUs, and we can edit these things in a, in you know the way that you would expect to be able to edit them within a, a a GUI environment, right? So just little slide bars here to give it more memory if I wanted to. I could give it more CPUs if I wanted to. Things like that. You could even tell it. Uh, whether you want these CPUs allocated via sockets or cores, right? Which is kind of cool. Like I could say, I'd like this in two sockets in one core each instead of two cores in one socket. And I, Scott, I don't know if there's a, uh, a performance reason you would do that. There might be. It could also come down to licensing, right? A lot of software is sometimes licensed by socket versus by core, right? So you may be able to better leverage your licensing this way too. Not your rel licensing exactly, but I know other products sometimes do it that way. Yeah, there's also some like uh, cores on the same socket will do stuff like share caching um, or mm -hmm. share some caching together. So there are some slight performance things, but unless you're like really cranking on the compute, you probably wouldn't notice too much. Right, right. All right, so let's actually do something here in the web console. What do you think? So we've got we've got uh, ITT0 open here. Let's just add a disk. What do you think? Let's click add disk. And it lets me define what pool I want to put the disk in. I've got a couple pools that are defined here. Uh, default is just the generic name for, uh, in my case, it's var lib libvert images is where I keep all my disk images. And that's the default location. Uh, we're going to give it a name. I don't know, we'll call it new disk. No, actually, let's do a better job of that. IPT0 dash disk one. Because I already have disk zero, because as we mentioned earlier, all arrays start at zero. We'll make it one gigabyte and we'll click the add button. What that's going to do is it's going to make a new virtual disk formatted in QCOW2 format, which is also thin provisioned, so that as I write to that disk, it'll start to consume disk space. Um, but if I, uh, before I've written to it, it should be effectively empty, very close to empty, right? So this is a great, this is a better way for me in my home lab to be able to allocate, uh, storage. So the disc is already added. If I turn the system on now, and that's another cool thing. You can see there's a console right over here, a little tiny console that's very hard to see and very hard to work with, but I can expand it here and now it'll bring up the console. And here we are at the console. I apologize if that's hard to see. I don't know if I can make this any bigger, but uh, let me see if I can remember 
my you login to, here. To make that bigger, you have to go into some of the arguments for the kernel to like change the sizing of your TTY stuff. But right. if viewing is a problem, guess what also works here? A graphical user interface. So yes, that is true. GUI desktop um, within this web console window too. So now I just logged in and I did an LSBLK and you can see there's another disk right there, VDB. So it was that easy to add a new disk and there it is already in my system. You can even live attach those. Um, I didn't want to risk showing that on live <laughs> stream, but if you've got a server that's up and you just need to add disk to it, you can actually attach a disk through Versh and I think through Web Console that'll just automatically show up as though you had plugged in a, a disk, like a USB disk. It doesn't show up like a USB disk, but it's the same concept, right? All of a sudden a new disk shows up and then you can you can log into your system, refresh and uh, actually allocate that disk to whatever you want to use it for. So, you know, oh no, home is getting full. I need to add some more disk, that kind of thing. Okay. Um, any other questions about web console? This, this is essentially how I manage my systems, right? Um, server with GUI, the famous. Yes, sure. <laughs> Only in Scott's world. <laughs> this is as close to a GUI as I get on my servers. <laughs> All right. Oh, there is one more thing I could show you in, in web console here. And again, all the stuff I'm showing you in Web Console is also accessible through Versh. That's the beauty of that API. We can also take snapshots. You see this section here about snapshots. If I wanted to, I don't know, say I'm about to do an upgrade, or in my home lab example, maybe I have my system in a like a pristine state, and I'm about to try something new that I want to be able to revert to so I can try it again. Like maybe I'm preparing for a demo, for example. Uh, I can make a snapshot right here. And you can see it automatically gives it a name that matches the host name of the, or I should say the guest name of the system, and it puts a date on it. I can put a description on it. Snapshot before I destroyed my system, and I click Create. And what this will do is it'll make a snapshot chain, even though that's a QCOW2 image, right? It can still take a snapshot of that system, right? Which was a thing I thought you could only do with LVM-based VMs, but it's able to do it, which is pretty awesome. So now if I were to go back to that console, and I don't know, let's do the, let's do the famous. Yeah, yep, yeah, you can totally trust me. I'm not about to destroy things, right? Uh, all right, it's off the bottom of the screen here and I can't really see what it's asking me. <laughs> yeah. Apparently my console is not working out well here. All right. Well, you get the point. I could be doing terrible things, but I can't tell what it's asking me. Maybe it's asking me yes or no. Are you sure you want to destroy the file system on this machine? I don't know. At any rate, um, if we were then to wait for this to... to uh, Oh, it's dangerous to recurse. Yes, okay, do it anyway. Um, let's just kill this in the middle because that should probably... Here, if we click on this, we can do that force shutdown and then it's going to just forcibly kill the VM. And now theoretically, if we try to run it again, it's not going to boot. Let's see if it, if it makes a liar out of me. It seems to be booting. I was, I was kind of hoping it was going to be a lot more disastrous. Well, at any rate, we can restore the snapshot, which is the whole thing I was trying to show you. If we click the revert button here, we can revert it to what happened, the state that the system was in before the snapshot. And that's the whole point of snapshots. So I was really hoping for my disaster to actually work properly, but whatever. All right, and that's what I had for Web Console. We got some more topics to cover. Any questions that came through? We did get a couple questions. First off, I want okay. to note that you failed to fail. I failed to fail only because the console was off the bottom of the screen and I couldn't solve that easily without uh, fumbling around on stream. <laughs> um, so here's one from uh, Kamaraju. Can we run Windows guests as VMs? 
Absolutely. Uh, QEMU I, and KVM support a host of guests. I mean, there's a bunch of guests that you can run within here. I've I've emulated DOS machines <laughs> just to see if I could, right? And, uh, I wouldn't uh, recommend that in a production environment, but yes. And back in the early days of KVM and uh, virtualization on Linux, uh, Red Hat entered into an agreement with Microsoft where we traded data back and forth. Uh, they would trade us data on... Uh, helping Windows machines run better under KVM. And we traded them data on how to help RHEL and Linux guests run better under Hyper-V. So um, we've had Windows support on KVM for quite some time, thanks to this uh, partnership with Microsoft. Sorry, I'm just fixing this VM to show you here. There's a Windows 10 box, which I don't know if I remember any of the credentials for, but I set this up for something I was trying out, and there you go, Windows 10. It should boot up just fine. Yeah, and Aaron uh, Aaron Kolb mentioned that we should use the Verdeo driver for uh, Windows to help uh, manage some of its disk I/O stuff, which I think yeah. will automatically be selected. Will it not? I believe so. It's been a while since I've done Windows virtualization on KVM. But yes, I believe it's actually built into the driver packs that come with Windows now. So it's automatically installed. It's detected as hardware. Does it work uh, so with another... KVM cluster? Yeah, so this one's a hard question to answer because I don't know uh, what, what we're talking about for cluster. So there is a cluster software you can get for Red Hat Enterprise Linux called HA Add-on. And you can set yep. up virtual machines to be managed as the service that you're interested in monitoring. Um, and KVM does natively provide live migration between hosts. So right. uh, you can set it up with HA out on as long as you have shared storage to move VMs from one host to another. And you can even do it live. Um, the was a kubevert implementation used by open source uh, open shift virtualization mm -hmm. uh, they use avm live migration and they use kubernetes as their like cluster backend for managing right. resources and stuff for moving vms from one to another so so yes um, but it depends on what cluster technology and how you're building that cluster how you would actually do that yeah a lot of it comes down to what underlying infrastructure you need like uh, a lot of times high performance clustered file systems for example require some other layer of clustering, which is where the HA add-on for RHEL might come into play. You can treat your VMs as resources within there. I think, Scott, you already mentioned that while I was getting my Windows system uh, under under control there. Um, but yeah, and, and I did that, actually. Before, before I ran Red Hat virtualization in a production environment, we used to do Zen clusters, and then we did KVM clusters. This was back in the RHEL 5 and then RHEL 6 days. Uh, hosted by Red or managed by Red Hat Cluster Suite with uh, clustered LVM in the background, and it worked right. Uh, it was really the predecessor to our our clustered virtualization at the place I was at. All right, anything else, have, or should I move on? We have one more, and then okay. and then let's move on. Um, so Shantanu asked, "Does the KVM stack support drives between two VMs?" Um, and the answer is, don't do that. <laughs> um, yes, it will permit you to do that. Yeah. Don't do that. Um, there well, is no... Sorry, I was going to say, yeah. again, this comes down to how your infrastructure needs to work. Um, anytime you have a disk that is shared by more than one system, there needs to be some mechanism that handles file locking and file reads and writes, right? So could you share the disk? Sure. How do you manage the disk? What file system is it running? How are locks managed? You, you got to think about all that before you try to read and write from two places. So you got to have all your ducks in a row. Yeah. And so like natively, we don't manage file locking on the file system. So you'd have right. to have some other technology to do that if you want to do that. That said, um, if you want to share the same disk to both systems and one is read only, that's yep. cool because they don't have to worry about file locking. Um, yep. The other thing is when I worked in training and certification a number of years ago, um, they used disk overlays and then would present the overlay to VMs. So they had one single QAMU 
uh, sorry, QCAL2 image that was the disk. And then they'd create like a bunch of machines off of that template. And the way that they did it was for each new machine they wanted to make, they'd make an overlay file for it to store its uniqueness. Um, mm -hmm. So it wasn't a direct tie into the single disk. Instead, there yeah. was a copyright area for each machine to manage its own state. And that That's required us to not have file locking. That's very similar to how the snapshotting technology that I was showing before works, right? It has an overlay that you can then either revert to if you needed to, or just blow away when the machine goes away. Uh, it's how you might do like uh, VDI, right? You might have a template and then you would overlay that with the user's changes and then they would go away when the machine gets shut down. All right, what do you got next for us, Nate? All right, so next we're gonna go back to the terminal because I like terminals. That's why I'm one of the co-hosts of this show. All right, so one of the ways, there's a couple ways that you can deploy new VMs or even maybe replicas of VMs on a KVM machine. Uh, one of those is a tool called Vert Clone. It, just, it does exactly what you might think it does. Let me just uh, copy my command out here, paste it in here. All right, so this is a vert clone command. You might have remembered when I looked at that verse list dash dash all, there was a VM called ATT0. That is not AT&T, the phone company. It's just a name <laughs> for uh, <laughs> another machine that I had running. All right, so vert clone dash O, which you might think is output, but it's not. That's original dash O. ATT0, that's the VM I want to clone from. Dash N, ATT clone zero, dash N is the name that I want to clone to. Dash F is not dash force. So that's the file I want to write the disk to, right? So we've got, we're, we're telling it to clone ATT zero to a new machine called ATT clone zero. And we're going to put the disk in var lib libvert images, ATT clone zero disk zero dot qcow two. If I hit enter, it's going to start the process to do that. Now, there's some things you want to think about when you're cloning VMs. Um, this is handy if you're in a situation where you've got a single like golden image that you want to base all of your systems from. Now, there's other ways to handle this, but this is one way to do it, right? You have this VM that's defined. It has all your base tooling and whatever on it, and you want to base all your new machines off of that. You can use Vert Clone to do that. However, there's identifying information that's in any VM, like the SSH keys. Right, so the the key that the SSH daemon uses when it starts up, um, hardware differences, uh, the MAC address for your your Ethernet address, your Ethernet adapter that's stored inside a UDIV somewhere. Right, so these are all things you want to clean out before you make a system you're going to use for cloning purposes. Otherwise, you're going to end up with a bunch of repetition of stuff, and it's going to cause headaches later. So keep that in mind before you start basing your deployment mechanisms on Vert Clone. This is the way we did it on that. KVM cluster I talked about earlier. We had a machine called Clone Me. Every quarter or so, we would build a new Clone Me based on our, our standards. We would sanitize it, clean out all those identifying information, and then that's what we would make new VMs from. Really simple. You saw it took about, I don't know, 25 seconds here. See that? 25 seconds to clone this system. So pretty handy, right? It's a great way to get it done. And then if we look at virtual list again, You'll see there's now a new ATT clone somewhere in here. Here it is, right? ATT clone zero. And then there's the original ATT zero. Now, the one caveat is you're going to want the source VM to be shut down before you do the clone. So if you're trying to clone a production box, you're still going to have to get a maintenance window to do that. So just keep that in mind. All right, any questions on vert clone? Not on Vert Clone, but we did have an interesting question about uh, Rev and local virtualization. Let me okay. Bring it up. Uh, so Adam, for first time chatter. Um, thanks for loving the show. Yeah. Since Rev is going to be replaced by OpenShift virtualization, does that mean that local virtualization will also be ended? I have not seen any roadmaps that are getting rid of local virtualization. As far as I know, this is going to continue to live on. Uh, this is not the. This doesn't really solve the same problem that Rev did, though. It doesn't solve the same problem that uh, OpenShift virtualization, virtualization solves either. This is meant to be sort of a simpler way to virtualize, right? Did I get that right, Scott? Uh, mostly. So I'll I'll like take out some of the weasel words that Nate used. 
um, and say, no, local <laughs> virtual not be removed from the distribution. In fact, uh, we've removed some of the business rules about it. Um, we did that a few years ago. It used to be that you could only run like four VMs on RHEL, something, something. That's all out the window. You can do what you want with it now. Um, the, the big thing that's a difference between running local virtualization using RHEL and using something like Red Hat virtualization, which is um, in, in its exit period, it is going to be yeah. shut down. Um, or OpenShift Vert, which is our active hypervisor uh, management solution. The big difference between the two is tooling, right? So just like earlier today, we were talking about, you know, clustering and live migration and, you know, that kind of stuff. Could you do it with locally running VMs? Absolutely. You would have to write all the tooling to make that work though. Right? Right. Whereas OpenShift virtualization, it relies on Kubert to like figure it out and, and manage that as well as managing storage and figuring out what nodes are healthy and a variety of other things that you would want in a more structured virtualization solution. Um, so like, yes, you can do local virtualization, but realize that as you're gaining complexity in your infrastructure, if you're using local rel guests, you have to use, write all the tools to account for that complexity. Whereas right. when you move to virtualization platforms, like OpenShift or, or Proxmox or Nutanix, um, they're providing that I- instead, right? So you're um, adding some additional software into your stack uh, and maybe some additional cost into your stack for support and maintenance and whatnot. But you're also gaining these additional tools that help you deal with some of those management problems that you get as your scale increases. Right. And that's exactly the the sort of train that we went down at that previous employer I was talking about, where we had KVM uh, clusters that were under Red Hat Cluster Suite, the management of it, there was no technical reason that it wasn't working. It was doing the job, right? But managing it got to be, you know, you needed me. Like it wasn't easy to just hand to a new admin or something and say, here you go, manage some VMs. It didn't have the nice slick UI. It didn't have the automation and stuff that's built into a fully baked enterprise virtualization platform, which is why we went to Red Hat virtualization, right? And now, you know, if we were making that choice again today, it would be OpenShift virtualization, right? So, or, you know, one of the other alternatives, but yeah, that's exactly why. (laughs) Or Proxmox, yes, I see comments about Proxmox. (laughs) Um, So Nate- Proxmox uses Perl, is that what I see in the chat? All right, I like Proxmox already. Do, do we have one more topic to get through today? Uh, we theoretically have two, but I'll try to get through them relatively quickly because we're over time already. Um, I wanted to touch a little bit on networking. Uh, we didn't really talk about this at all. I have a relatively complex network set up here. Uh, I guess if you're used to enterprise networking, it's not as complex as I might lead it on to be. But if you're just a home labber, uh, it might be. I have a setup where I've got actual VLANs that isolate things like my home lab from my IoT stuff, from you know services that I run at home like Plex and whatever. Uh, so I wanted to just quick show you that in. Um, oh, that wasn't what that is what I wanted to do. Okay, so in Web Console, there's this really nice networking uh, panel that you can manage your networks, and you can see I've got I don't know how easy this comes through on the stream because the font's kind of small but I've got a couple bridges set up here. And these are bridges to different VLANs within my network. I've got one for services, one for IoT, and one for lab. That ITT zero box that we were using as our our example, that lives on bridge 20 lab. That's VLAN 20 to my my home network. Um, And you can see that if we go into virtual machines and find ITT zero, let me find him here. Here he is, ITT0, and click on down here where it says network interfaces. It says bridge, and right here, bridge 20 lab. And if I edit this, you can see I can pick any of those other network interfaces that I want to bridge to. KVM does have a isolated, I shouldn't say isolated, a natted virtual network as well. And that'll be your default when you spin up a new VM, right? And that'll give you like a 192.168 address, which will then nat to whatever network your hypervisor is connected to. So if it can get to the internet from there, it can. If not, then it can't, right? So that's just a little bit on networking. 
the networking can get as complicated or as easy as you want it to be, right? If you want to just go with a simple natted network, you can certainly do that. All right. And uh, let's see. The last thing is you might be curious, uh, how do we install a new VM, right? What if I want to install something either from scratch or from an existing disk image? Let's go back to the terminal over here. Clear the screen. Uh, we've got, there's a tool called vert install, which I've got some scripts that wrap around this to make this a little easier. When I want to spin up a new VM, I just tell it, make a new VM and call it this, and it'll make me a, a basic VM. Uh, this is based on a QCOW image that came from Image Builder, right? So I went to Image Builder. I think I used the, the one in Insights, the Insights Image Builder to make this one. I laid out a basic a basic layout that I wanted for my systems, and I have a uh, just a, a disk file that I keep in my hypervisor that I then copy whenever I want to make a new VM. So, all right, let's walk through what this is doing. Vert install. We're going to give it a name. We're going to call it ITT1. We're going to give it four gig of memory. We're going to give it two ZP two vCPUs. We're going to tell it to run RHEL, right? Uh, and these OS variants are baked into libvert. It basically tells it, it gives it like a base for what the hardware profile should look like so it can better support the guest, right? This auto console, call, <laughs> auto console none means don't immediately bring me into an installation console because if you do vert install and don't tell it that, it'll bring you immediately to that console we showed you earlier, that serial console because it expects that you're going to have to do the installation. It's going it, to it thinks you're going to have to answer questions and whatever. But we're going to tell it to import a disk and this is the disk we're going to have it import. And again, you can also do this through web console. Uh, there's an import when you go to create a new VM, there's an import button that you can say use this existing disk image. And this ITT0 or 1 disk 0 is a copy I've already made of that basic disk image that I told you about. And you can see it didn't even take a second. We have a new VM. If we do a versh list, we should see ITT1 is already running. And if we go back to virtual machines and scroll down to ITT1, you should see it's already at a look, it's already up at a uh, at a login prompt. It's that quick, right? Now, the other mechanism is with an ISO, and this is what we're going to close with. I'm not going to walk you through a whole new installation, but if we're going to go to create VM here within the UI in Web Console, I don't know, let's make ITT3, and we're going to tell it where to get an operating system from. You can actually tell it to download it from the web, or you can use a Pixie boot, but we're going to use a local ISO image. It asks me where the installation ISO is var lib libvert isos slash, I don't know, let's use the rel 9.4 beta image that I have sitting here. It doesn't detect it properly because it's the 9.4 beta and I'm on a 9.3 hypervisor and it doesn't know what 9.4 is. That's why it says Euro Linux 9. Uh, we're going to say red, I guess it was, there we go. Red Hat Enterprise Linux. We're going to go 9.3 because that should be fine. We're going to have it create us a new disk image, right? We're going to tell it how big to make the disk image. Let's make it 20 gig because 10 is kind of small for a rel installation. How much memory do we want? And then we're going to go create and run. And it's going to make a new VM. It's going to use some defaults for like networking and whatnot. And it's going to boot us into the install environment on that ISO. So let me find ITT2 that we just made. Look, there it is already. You can see the console. Is already at the boot menu for the RHEL 9.3 installation. And if we just give this a second, you'll see the GUI environment for installation, which again, we're not going to walk through. I just want to show you how that works. Uh, so there's a little bit of chatter about Image Builder. Um, mm -hmm. Sean asks, Image Builder can build from a local ISO now. The answer is no. What Nate was showing was uh, cockpit machines building from a local ISO now. Right. Um, so image builder is a little bit uh, different technology. Yeah, what I was showing there was image builder built me a base rel image, and then I used that as a source for a new VM, right? I didn't have it call image builder or something like that to build me a new system right there on the spot. I had done that previously, and I've already got a copy of it on my hypervisor. All right, any other questions? 
Uh, since since they all brought up Image Builder, why would you use Image Builder instead of a local system install? Uh, well, I do it because it automates, or I should say, it removes some of the manual steps I'd have to take if I if I were to install every machine from an ISO. Now, you could do an ISO with a kickstart file. You could do, you know, a Pixie environment that automates installs. I just chose to do it this way because I'm not some huge enterprise, and it's really easy to just have that golden image sitting there ready to go. So um, I... I think it's it's a great alternative to Kickstart because Kickstart is getting to be an older uh, technology at this point. And while it is it is very powerful, things like Automation Platform or Ansible can easily do a lot of the automation you used to do in Kickstart and do it in a better way. And Image Builder is meant to fill in the pre-build part, which is like partition tables and... Um, you know, initial things like that that are hard to change after the fact. So I think image builder plus automation afterward is kind of the way people should be thinking about building systems. Um, so also on the lower third here, I put on the labs page. So yep. if you're interested in image builder uh, or using web console, um, if you go to lab.redhat.com, there's a whole bunch of free and open lab exercises that are built to be self-paced. Um, we don't cover local virtualization yet, but what I wanted to point out is that all the backed VMs that are used for these labs are built using Image Builder uh, and deployed into a cloud provider of Red Hat's choice. So yep. um, we eat the dog food, not, not just feed it to our other friends. It really is a nice tool. I mean, I when... I don't want to go down a whole rabbit hole, but when I first saw Image Builder, I thought, oh, just another way to get a base image. But it really is nice. It really is a nice tool. And I think uh, I think we did a good job on that one. And it's always expanding, right? The features that are in there and some of the stuff you can build in at build time is, is really nice. All right, so does that run us off the end, Nate? I think it does. That's everything I was going to cover. Unless there's any other questions, I think we're uh, we're about done. Only... 18 minutes over. Right on Please time. Sir. We'll be sad. <laughs> uh, I thought we were going to nail it 30 minutes. We started on time. Like, man, but no. And uh, uh, what was I saying before the show? I feel like we don't have a ton of content, so it should be fine. And then here we are. <laughs> um, so next week, next week, we're going to cover file permissions which is a, kind of a step back from some of the topics that we've been talking about. It's it's more introductory. Um, and then we'll do a follow-on episode to talk about special permissions and file system ACLs after that. Um, but for folks that are just starting with Linux, file permissions are really hard to understand. So we'll do a walkthrough of that. Um, and then Royal Presents is in a couple of weeks, but they haven't assigned their episode yet. So stay tuned for that as Eric gets it scheduled. And then I think we're going to be off for a bit because we have Red Hat Summit coming up. Yeah, I think there's going to be at least a week that we miss. And yeah. uh, by the way, Scott, there was a question in chat about some IPA content, which, I mean, I don't know about you, but I'd rather do IDM content. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know if that fits the end of the terminal format or not, but there is actually some new content that will be coming out uh, around IDM and a new feature that's coming. Uh, probably around the summit time frame. So if you subscribe to the rel channel, you should see that when it pops up. Right on. Uh, also, I would note that uh, Eric has scheduled a product update announcement for mid-May. Um, so take read into that what you will, uh, but that is coming. I don't know what that could possibly be. Oh, no, it's only I the mean, middle of the year. Every six months It's not we do like we that. have a predictable release cycle that could lead into what that might be. It's so, a total uh, mystery, though. <laughs> right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, those of you who are deferred viewing, please feel free to leave us a comment. We will be happy to uh, to answer it. Uh, you may see that in our other videos, too. And um, don't forget to like and subscribe. Yeah, everybody have a great one.